Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Scott Bailey uh, talking about soils. I remember an old UVM professor that always kept reminding us that it's all about the soil. So, Scott, it's all yours. So I'm going to start with a little poll. How many people know that this is 2015 is the year of the soil? All right. And that last Saturday was World Soil Day. Not so good on that one. So I'm going to try to pick up where the United Nations leaves off with those initiatives and, and talk about soils and the audacity of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. Um, and I'm, going to, I'm taking a little different tack than, than the other speakers, and I'm, I'm going to have very little data in this, this talk. And the reason for that is that it seems to me we're, we're living in a time when the American public has perhaps an, an increasing distant relationship and understanding of science. Uh, and that's maybe especially true of our institutional and our political leaders. Uh, so I, I think it's important to, to share our data and to try to educate the public on wh what it's showing us. But, but I think we also need to be more and more talking to them about what science is and how science works. And so that's the way I, I'm going to approach this talk, is, is to tell you about this uh, soil uh, initiative that the VMC has started. So if we think about some of the fundamental resources that we rely on, things like air and water and soil. So for air, we, we had the first Clean Air Act in, in 1963, and we've had uh, the 1970 and another one, the 1990 amendments. We heard about those with acid rain. We have monitoring networks all around the country and the world that monitor our air quality such as the CastNet network run by EPA featured here and, and our one site in Vermont that's a representative of that network. Uh, water, we have the Clean Water Act of 1972. Again, we have all kinds of monitoring programs that, that sample water and tell us what our trends and water quality are over time. But there isn't a Clean Soil Act. There's no big monitoring network that I know that samples soil repeatedly over time and, and says, how is the soil trending? Uh, so I think it's kind of a little bit of a mystery to me why this is. And, and partially, um, I, I, I can't understand what, what the reason is. So in, in, in trying to convey this to you today, I thought, well, wh how am I going to say what the importance of soil is in just a few minutes? And being trained as a geologist, I thought, well, geez, what would Earth be like without soil? So <laughs> here's one possible way to look at this. It'd be like turning the clock back to the Silurian about 425 million years ago. So imagine this is, this is a picture. This could be Vermont. This is what Vermont looked like 425 million years ago. It's a little bit gloomy looking on the top there. Uh, so. With, without this, this resource, we really don't have much going on in the terrestrial environment. So maybe uh, uh, that, that's really uh, a mystery why we don't pay more attention to this. Uh, but there are some, some more fundamental or some maybe even scientific reasons about why we don't do soil monitoring so much. And, and that is maybe that it's hard. Uh, so, Soil change, uh, detecting changes in soil over time is, is really tough from a scientific point of view for, for three reasons. First, soils change very slowly. So uh, we had a little uh, resetting of the clock here in Vermont. After the Silurian, the soil, soils did start to build up. But then we had this ice age that came along and erased uh, all the existing soils in Vermont. And when, this, when the glaciers left about 10,000 years ago, the soil started to develop. So, here you can see a picture of Vermont, uh, slightly more recent than the earlier one. And, and the soils that we have now really started to develop at this time and have been developing very slowly ever since uh, the woolly mammoths were wandering around on them. Uh, so detecting change in, in the, the time span of, uh, that we operate with science is, is very difficult. Second, soils are very complex and heterogeneous. If you're standing out in the environment, chances are the soil that's under your right foot is a little bit different than the soil that's under your left foot. Um, 
So it, we can go to a stream and we can dip a bottle in it and we can uh, say what the water quality is or we can go back to that stream at some point later and dip a bottle in the same place and say how the stream has changed. We have this spatial problem with soils that you can't dig a hole in the same place twice because uh, your disturbance effect from digging the first hole is part of the story of the second hole. So you have to go somewhere else and, and deal with this spatial complexity. Uh, third is that soils are alive. So if I take a, a water sample out of a stream and I measure it in the lab, it's pretty much the same water that was in that stream. But as soon as I take the soil out of the ground, by the time I've got it into my laboratory, it's not quite the same stuff. Um, and it continues to degrade as, as we work on it, it, it making our measurements. Uh, so the, the analyses of soils uh, are operationally defined. If we measure the available nutrients in a soil sample, we're using that as an index. We're hoping that's an index of what was actually going on in the ground before we, we took that soil out of the ground. So, so there's these technical analytical problems as, as well. So uh, around 1998 or so, uh, Sandy Wilmot had a vision that Vermont Monitoring Cooperative needed to have a soil program. Uh, the VMC had been going for about eight years then. All kinds of interesting monitoring programs that had been started, but uh, Sandy thought, well, we really, soils are really important and we need to be doing this. And, and she convened a meeting that, that I was invited to at the, at the Proctor Lab on April 29th, 1998. I dug up my, my notes from this meeting to prepare for this lecture. Uh, so uh, if, if people don't believe uh, some of these things, I've got the proof, but um, I was a little bit green at the time. I had recently uh, gotten a PhD and, and landed a job at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest and Sandy invited me to this meeting and I, I don't think I really understood why she had invited me. I probably thought it had something to do with the amazing research program that I had started. Um, but at some point in the meeting, Sandy turned to me and she said, okay, Scott, would you please tell us how does the long-term soil monitoring program work at Hubbard Brook? And this is when I was horrified uh, to find out why I had been invited to this meeting because Hubbard Brook, this world famous uh, ecosystem research institution didn't have a long-term soil monitoring program. It still doesn't. Um, but Sandy was not dissuaded by this and and several of us were inclined to, uh, to uh, join her in this vision and, and try to figure out how we could set this up with the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. So we set out to design a proact proactively design a long-term soil monitoring program. As was uh, mentioned by Jamie, it was designed to, to run for 200 years. And, and we, we worked on this very purposefully and slowly. It was from 1998 to 2002 when we collected our first samples to try to minimize some of these problems that, uh, that crop up that make it difficult to detect changes in soil over time. Uh, so we, we had this four-year design period. We had our first samples in 2002. We started to work up some results. And then we went out to the broader soil science community for sort of a check. And uh, Tom Villers uh, organized us to make this poster that was presented to the Soil Science Society of America meeting in Salt Lake City in 2005. And I was a little bit nervous about this. I don't know about uh, the others who were, who were with me there, but uh, this was really our first time to, to bring this out to the, our scientific colleagues and get a, kind of a test about whether we had done something that was going to be valid or not. And I was standing next to Dan Richter from Duke University as Tom was explaining this program and our design. And, uh, and Tom finished his explanation and Dan Richter turned to me and said something about like, wow, the audacity of it. I don't remember if those are his exact words, but he's my source of the word audacity. And, and I kind of liked that word, that we were being particularly bold and trying to do something that hadn't been done. And this was recognized by Dan Richter, the man who had written this book on understanding soil change. And for the most part, we were, we were given a few details about things that we might change, but we were encouraged to try to do this. 
So we went on and, and forged ahead and tried to continue to, to solve some of the problems. Don Ross led a heroic actor, effort to, uh, to lead to standardization of soil uh, lab testing procedures and to develop ways that we could uh, compare results between laboratories and know that we were getting the same types of results. This was just published this year in Ecospheres and involved almost every lab doing forest soil uh, analysis uh, in the eastern half of the country. Uh, Tom Villers has just led us in an effort to publish a paper to understand some of the spatial variation in these soils. And uh, rather than taking the spatial variation problem and thinking, well, this is a problem that keeps us from understanding soils, Tom has pointed out, well, this is an opportunity to maybe address uh, some fundamental questions about how we classify soils. And, uh, and, and that's what this paper that was just published this week uh, aims to address. And another product that, that flowed from this was at, at that Salt Lake City meeting in 2005. The next day after we had our poster, I had breakfast with Greg Lawrence, and we hatched the idea for a Northeastern Soil Monitoring Cooperative, which was largely inspired by what the VMC was doing and has since been active across the Northeast US and Canada. And just uh, about a month or two ago published this paper, again, addressing this recovery from, from acid deposition, which We've seen a lot of improvement in, in precipitation quality and, in, and water quality. We're just starting to see recovery in soils. And I think it's particularly important at this time when we're grappling with climate change to have examples like this that show that we can have policies that, that can make an effect, even if they do take years or decades to, to, to have that effect. So with that, I'd like to close up and say happy 25th anniversary of the VMC. Uh, long live the long-term soil monitoring project, 2002 to, to 2202. Our next sampling is on 2017. Uh, acknowledge some of the key players who were involved in this effort shown on the slide here. And one observation about these names is, in forestry terms, the list of names here is kind of like an even age stand. Um, <laughs> So Nancy Burt is our leader. She retired several years ago. Uh, in 2017, I think we can kind of imagine that we can do this and who's going to be doing this. Five years after that in 2022, it's more of a question. So I think uh, the, the main question I, I have at this point is, in the future, will the institutions who have supported this work and contributed to the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative continue to employ people who have the interests and the skills and give them the mandate to keep this work going. Thank you. <laughs>